Good morning to the Commonwealth. This is Young Honey with Raw Dog Radio, bringing you the greatest old-time radio station since the bombs fell. We're going to be hitting you with an arrangement of ragtime on a bridge stories and other old world medias. I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. Now, without further commentary, we're starting off with Frontier Gentlemen, a late 1950s story collection by John Denton. My second encounter with the Jesse James gang was a little more fortunate than the first. This is what happened. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just a moment, we will bring you the latest report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Keeping one ear to the ground may offer fine possibilities for calisthenics. But when it comes to keeping up with world affairs, you'll find CBS News much more reliable, much more convenient, too. Regularly scheduled CBS News programs, like those featuring Walter Cronkite and Wells Church, come to you on most of these same stations throughout the week. They keep you right up to the minute with history, with concise, informative reports. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. Thaddeus Clark was a miner returning to Illinois from the western Wyoming gold mining country. He and I shared a common bond. We had both been held up by Jesse James and his companions outside of Laramie. But Clark had been relieved of some $5,000 in gold dust, whereas my loss, although leaving me stony broke, amounted to a matter of only $20. In all friendliness and goodwill, Clark offered to pay for my ticket to Cheyenne, where I was sure my remittance from England would be waiting I accepted the loan, and the two of us boarded the train. As we waited in the station for our departure, I commented to the conductor on the fact that except for us, the carriage was empty. Yeah, these days, folks is moving west. Not many coming back. You should have seen us last trip out to Salt Lake. Biggest crowd in the year. Any particular reason for that? No, just like a plague of locusts. No telling why. Same with eastern folks. Seems they all decided once to pull up stakes and head out this way. Of course, there'll be more getting on in Cheyenne. How soon will we be pulling out, mister? Mm, about two minutes. Riding Cheyenne, barn Buffalo, Indians, and bad men at 4.30. Buffalo and Indians is all right. We've had enough of bad men. That's so. Trouble, huh? And we had the dubious honor of being held up by Jesse James. You don't say. <laughs> well, now, Jesse James. I'd given something to see him. We did. Well, sir, proud to have met you boys. Have a good trip. Jesse James. <laughs> He's impressed. He can afford to be. Now, what do you plan to do now? Do you still go back to Illinois? Well, I haven't made up my mind. Got enough to last for a while. Mm. And then maybe I'll go on back to Sweetwater country after I spend a little while in Cheyenne. Mm. Pan gold again? No. Unless I'm lucky enough to hit a vein. How about you? Oh, I'm not sure. I've been thinking about working my way through Dakota Territory. Then perhaps down to Kansas. I'd like to see Dodge City. Well... Can't say I'll be sorry to see the last of Lara. <laughs> I can't exactly blame you. Hey! Mm. Huh? Coming out of the waiting room. Those two men. Both men were well-dressed and carried no luggage. They ran toward the train and then disappeared from view. But I'd had enough time to recognize at least one of them. 
is Jesse James' companion, the one we knew only as C.D. They got on. I swear they did. Did you see him, C.D., did you? Yes. You think the other fellow's one of the gang? I never saw him without a mask, but I'd be willing to bet on it. Right. Keep your head down. Pretend to be asleep. I'll read the newspaper. All right. Oh, I swear, C.D., I don't know how you do it. <laughs> you just don't know. I don't Let's get him. No, not yet. Keep your head down. If they look back there. Can you see? What are they doing? They just sat down. Up at the front. I get my hands on that sneaking lowdown. And the question is, are the others on the train, too? You mean James? No. He might have gone further back. We didn't see him. My 5,000. If they've still got it, you might get it back. <laughs> What's going on now? Ah, uh, they've got a bottle. Taking a drink. All right. I think now's as good a time as any. Get out your gun. You sure it's loaded? Yep. They'll walk up there, quietly. They'll sit down behind them. If they see us before we get there, drop to the floor and start shooting. Don't worry. Anyway, come on, then. Listening to Arthur Godfrey time five days a week is a virtue that comes with a built-in reward. Arthur and the gang have just one thought in mind to bring you entertainment. Since their songs and comedy do just that, you do yourself a favor every time you tune them in. Every weekday, join us on most of these same stations for Arthur Godfrey Time. Two men who had robbed us, members of Jesse James' gang, occupied seats at the front of the carriage. Clark and I moved up the aisle toward them, the carriage rocking and swaying as we rounded a bend. We sat down behind them. <laughs> now listen, I tell you, I've seen it. I've seen it myself, Billy. This fella, he's only got one eye, and, and Frank, he don't like the way the carriage is going. Well, he figures the one-eyed gent is doing some fancy dealing. <laughs> So he skins his gun out. You've seen Frank draw. I sure have seen him draw. Well, he lays it on the table in front of him, and he says, Well, boys, we're going to have a fresh deal. The fellas in the game, they take one look at Frank's face. Just yeah. one, they say, All right, Frank, sure, sure, anything you say. <laughs> Frank says, All right, now we got that settled. And you know what he's doing all this time? <laughs> <laughs> he, he's tapping on that gun laying there. Well, he's talking, and he says, Now we got that settled, I'm saying right now, that from here on there ain't going to be nothing but square deal. I ain't making no accusation, nothing like that. But I'll tell you, if I catch any son of a gun cheating again, I'm going to shoot his other eye out. <laughs> Very good. Good story. But don't turn around, gentlemen. Just put your hands up. All the way. Hey. You don't know you? Recognize the voice, huh? Kendall? And Clark, where's my gold? All in good time. Better search them first. If they try anything while I'm doing it, Clark, shoot CD in the back of the neck. Right here. Uh, oh! Just so. An unexpected pleasure, C.D. I don't think I've met your companion. Billy. Billy Badger. All right, Billy. Keep those arms stretched nice and high. Mm. Quite an arsenal. And it does for you. Now, C.D., very carefully get up and come out into the aisle. Can you hold these, Clark? Mm. 
two more. Ah, that's better. What about the gold? Uh, yes, I was coming to that. Sit down, C.D. Now, what about Mr. Clark's gold? We ain't got it. Oh? Who has? Jesse? And where is Jesse? We don't know. Do we, Billy? No. That's a fact. We split up. Did you? And where did Mr. James go? I told you. We don't know. Oh, yeah, so you did. Which makes it rather awkward for you two gentlemen. Hey, now, now are you going to kill well, us? Now, look, you, you can't do that. Without the money you stole, you're not much use to well, us. Now, just w- wait a minute here. Hold on. I've, I've, I've got some. Here. Maybe 200 in gold. <laughs> Another 50 in paper. I got about the same. Hand it over. So that leaves about 4,500 you owe us. Well, now, now listen, we can give Shut it up, to you. Billy. But... You were saying? Nothing. Oh, all he meant was that well, when we get to Cheyenne, maybe we we'll raise the money there for you. Is that what he meant? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. They're lying, Kendall. I agree. No, we ain't lying on it. We sure ain't. You want first shot, Clark? Sure. Uh, not in the stomach, though. They they make so much noise. Well, now, 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 let down right. Well, murder. Look, Give us look, a chance. Kidding, Stand up in the aisle, boys. We don't want to get blood all over the seat. Wait now, a look. Wait a minute. You can get your money. Shut up, Billy. But just I... shut up. Kendall, I'll bet you five bucks you can't take off in here at five paces. Who's? Either one. I'll take Billy. You better bet. Uh, which ear, right or left? Um, left. Mm-hmm. Left. Now move over, CD. Billy, back up to the door. Well, now look, fellas. Yeah, you've got nothing to worry about, Billy. He's bluffing. Back up. But he's bluffing, Billy. How do you know? It ain't your ear. Yeah, that's far enough, Billy. Ready? You ain't got the guts, Kim. Don't worry, Billy. He ain't got the guts. Oh. Missed. That's five, you owe me. Same bet. You try it. All right. No. No, I'll tell you. You shut up, Billy. You shut up. He ain't shooting at you. Frank Stack. In the next carriage back. He's carrying them gold sacks we took off. Anybody else with him? No. Where's no, he's James? alone. Where is James? We're meeting him up ahead. Good. Now sit down again, both of you. Clark, I'll get stacked. You keep an eye on these fellows. What's he wearing, Billy? Oh, regular black sack coat, vest, bowler hat. He, he's about your height. Wouldn't you figure, C.D.? Yeah, I guess. Fine. If they give you any trouble, Clark... Well, we won't give no trouble, honey. <laughs> I moved back through the carriage and out onto the open platform, climbed over the railing and into the next coach. I looked for the conductor, but he was nowhere in sight. Then I spotted the man who answered the description of Frank Stack. He was sitting alone, but I felt uneasy when I saw that the seats both behind and in front of him were occupied. Keeping my gun hidden underneath my jacket, I quickly moved down the aisle and sat down next to Stack. Yeah, find another place, mister, right on... This is a gun stack. See? Now, we don't want any of the people in here to be hurt, do we? Hey, you're the fellow that... That's right, the one you held up near Laramie. Pick up your bag and walk ahead of me. Hey, now, listen, I don't have... Don't talk, just do as you're told. Yeah. Yeah, all right, Uh, don't, don't get itchy. We're going to join your friends up in the next coach. Walk slowly, behave yourself, and you may live until we reach Cheyenne. Yeah, yeah sure. That ain't going to prove nothing. Climb over the railing. Oh, that's dangerous. Man could get killed between the coaches. Man could get killed standing here unless he stopped arguing. I'll hold the bag. No, no, you don't have to. Oh, yes, I do. Thank 
Yup. Off you go. And open the door and go in. I thought you said there ain't nobody in here. Clark. Clark. Keeping Stack in front of me, I walked the length of the empty car. Then, where Clark had been sitting, I found him. The miner was sprawled out on the coach floor, wedged between seats. An ugly cut on his head, a trickle of blood running from it. Get more for the money you spend. Earn more on the money you save by making use of the practical information that comes your way on the business news. Throughout the week on CBS Radio, our business news brings you Walter Cronkite or Bill Downs with an up-to-the-minute report on price trends, marketing conditions, and everything else of a business nature that's likely to interest you. Join us on most of these same CBS radio stations when it's time for the next edition of the business news. I had a pretty good idea of where the other two road agents had gone. In front of our carriage was the mail and baggage car. I disarmed Stack, then forced him to lie face down on the floor while I tried to help Clark. It took about ten minutes for him to recover consciousness. Clark. Uh. Say, Clark. Uh. Clark. Oh. I, I thought I was dead. Clark, what happened? Well, we... We hit a, a rough bit of rail on a curve. It threw me off balance. And the next thing I knew, that CD was all over me. He, he got one of the guns we left lying on the seat. And that's what happened. Ooh. Uh, here, this might make you feel better. Open up the bag. Hey. What's he doing down there? You have to shoot him? No, he's just behaving himself. Hey! Hey, my gold! Let's see. Seven. Wait a minute. There's, there's only seven. Where's the other three sacks? You better ask him. Where's the rest of my gold, mister? Get up, Stack. Where is it? Jesse lost it in a poker game last night back in Laramie. He did, huh? Where are you supposed to meet James? Hmm? No, don't worry. You'll tell me. Clark, go and find the conductor. Tell him the other two are in the baggage car. Right. Now, here, take his gun with you. Now, Mr. Stack, I'm only going to ask you once more. Where are you meeting James? <coughs> more? No, no, no. You're you waiting at Hale Creek Bridge. Ah, so that's the game. Train hold up this time, huh? How many with him? Just one. Uh, what's the plan? If you flag down the train this side of the bridge, CD, Billy Badger, and me will clean out the baggage car and wait for the westbound out of Cheyenne. As soon as it crosses Dale Creek Bridge, we blow up the trestle and empty out their baggage car. I see. Single track. Two trains facing each other, bridge down. The only way to go is Laramie. You fellas hightail it for the east, right? Yeah. Hmm. Effective. By the time they're able to get to Laramie and telegraph the news to Cheyenne, I imagine you'll be well on your way to Dakota Territory. Well, we'll have to try to do something about this, won't we? He didn't answer. Just stood there, glaring at me. A minute or so later, Clark came back, followed by the conductor. I told them what was in store for us. The first thing we did was to bind Stack securely and place him under the guard of one of the other passengers. Then we had to work out the best plan of procedure. I don't know. Dale Creek Bridge ain't so far off. Maybe five minutes, probably less. We're making pretty fair time. Is there any way of getting into the baggage car beside through the door? No, sir. I got no key. Mail clerk must have opened it for them. Side door sealed, too. Only way to get in is to 
blow it in. No, no, if you ask me, we'll keep right on going. Ryder right into Cheyenne. Then we can let the marshal get him out. It's a good idea, except for one thing. If James has already got the charge laid to the bridge, and we don't stop on signal, he might blow it up. Not with his own boys aboard. Well, I shouldn't like to risk the lives of your passengers on the supposition that James has a tender heart. How much gold are you carrying in the baggage car? Hundred thousand? Mister, from what hmm. I've seen of Jesse James, for a hundred thousand in gold, he'd set fire to his own mother. He won't give two hoots and a holler about the rest of his gang. Yeah, yeah. Now, if they don't suspect that anything is wrong, when they signal you to stop, you stop. Now, there's only two of them. I want to avoid the possibility of one meeting the train and the other waiting to set up the charge. Once we can get them both in sight, we can shoot it out. Makes good sense to me. I'll go up and tell the engineer. No, you, you warn the passengers. Tell them not to panic. I'll talk to the engineer. You'll have to go over the top of the baggage car. I'll manage. Well, we better get a move on. We haven't much time. But it took longer than I thought it would to convince a highly suspicious engineer so that by the time he agreed to stop the train, if so ordered, we were only a scant minute from Dale Creek. I remembered the trestle from another trip I had taken a few weeks before. It was more than 130 feet high, spanning a chasm between six and 700 feet in width. The thought of a charge blowing up as we were crossing was not pleasant. I left the engine cab and had just reached the platform standing between the baggage car and the coach when there was a scream of brakes. See anything? Uh, not yet. Yes, there's one. He's on horse, standing by the engine. I can't see who it is. Nobody on this side. Well, unless they're going to blow up the side of the car, James is either going to have to get in through here, or C.D. and Badger will have to come out. Maybe they're waiting for one of the boys to get off. You figure it's some kind of signal we don't know about? I don't know. Wait a minute. There's another. Both of them now. Come over here. Yep. Yeah. That's James on the black horse, see? Yeah. You keep back. Kendall, look out! Is it? Jesse, it's a trap! Look out, Sid! Come on, Captain, let's get out of here! Uh, give me your gun, Clark! But it was too late. Jesse James and his companion were gone. When we reached Cheyenne, Frank Stack and the bodies of C.D. and Billy Badger were turned over to the marshal. Thad Clark recovered all but $750 of his fortune, and I, my $20. As well as being able to boast that I had fired at and missed the notorious Jesse James. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell as Clark, Stacey Harris as C.D., Charles Seal as the conductor, and Vic Perrin as Billy Badger. <laughs> Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman, Bud Sewell speaking.
I feel that I cannot leave Wyoming Territory without describing my encounter with Nebraska Jack and his remarkable family. Frontier Gentlemen. an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just a moment, we will bring you this latest report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Seven mornings a week on CBS Radio, the World News Roundup presents accurate eyewitness reports on the big news stories of the day. The World News Roundup puts you in touch with the great news capitals while you breakfast or drive to work. Start each day fully informed. Hear these reports direct from where the news is happening as most of these same stations bring you the World News Roundup. At the top of the day or late in the evening, hear all the news on CBS Radio. Now, starring John Daner. This is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I was on my way to the South Pass District. We were driving through Little Snake Country when the stagecoach in which I was riding developed a hot box. That is to say, one of the wheels, through lack of grease, had clogged and were no longer turned. The axle became red hot. And so when we limped into the next stage station, there was no choice but to wait for repairs a matter of two or three hours. I decided to rent a horse and was told by the attendant that if I rode down to the river, I should pay my respects to Nebraska Jack. Yes, sir. Now, if I was a stranger in these parts, I'd sure want to amble down and make his acquaintance. What does he Do? Do? He don't do nothing right now, except sit around and take his ease. It's what he did that counts, mister. Old Jack. Ain't nothing much he can't tell you about the opening up of this country. That is, if he feels like it. Now, if I was you, I'd buy me a bottle of gut warmer and take it on down to him. Best way I know to loosen up his talking talents. Oh? Uh-huh. Well, uh, do you happen to know where I could uh, So find... happens I got a couple of bottles right here. Yeah, old Jack's favorite brand. Never drinks nothing else. I reckon he's about due for a refill. He'll take it real kindly, mister. Uh, how much? Uh, three dollars. Three? Oh, yeah, three dollars. And one dollar for the horse, uh, thirty for the saddle. Don't care about the horse, but good saddles is hard to come by. Of course, you get the thirty back when you bring in the saddle. I see. Yes, yeah, sir. Now, you come out back, I'll get you fixed up. Well, how do I find this place? Ain't nothing to it. Just follow the wagon road till you come to a sign saying Nebraska Jack's place, keep out. Here's a trail right down to the river. You can't miss it. Ah, here's a mighty fine little horse. Ain't got nothing to worry about with him. Get you there and get you back. He's just a bit um, sway-backed, wouldn't you say? Him? Shucks, no. That's just the way he's made. That there's a real clear-footed rocking chair critter. he give you any trouble, though. You just lay your quirt on his get-up end. He'll do just fine. Just fine. As it turned out, my suspicions were correct. The clear-footed, gentle critter turned out to be what my friend Shorthorn Tom would have called, among other things, a whey-bellied stump sucker. The animal managed to stumble in every gopher hole and over every rock on the trail. In fact, he sought them out. I followed the wagon road until I reached the sign reading, Nebraska Jack's Place keep out. Then I turned off onto the river trail. I had gone about 300 yards when... Get that cow hawk turned head off my land and you with it before I unravel you. Um, it's Nebraska Jack, isn't it? Yeah, darn right. Can't you read the sign back yonder? Uh, yes. Next one, I'm going to shoot through the water barrel and drown you. No, wait. I brought you some whiskey. Oh, I see. Here. 
We keep that model in sight. I'm a riding this way slow, slow and easy. And I'll get a move on the move. You got a gun, Pilgrim. Now don't you get itchy to use it. Just throw down that wild mare's milk, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> well, now that's mighty kindly of you, mister. Mighty kindly. You come down from the stage station, did you? That's right. <laughs> I thought so. Ollie Monaghan, he sent you over, huh? Well, I didn't catch his name. It was the station attendant. Ah. Ollie, oh, that's who it was. Every once in a while, he sends along some young green fella like you come out to see the wild and woolly west. Sends him over to see old Nebraska Jack. <laughs> if I'm around, I usually throw some hot lead, kind of makes them feel they're living dangerous. Yeah, I scared one fella so much a couple of months back, he lost his horse. Ended up busting his head again at that tree over yonder. Really? <laughs> Fact. I like to die laughing. Uh, come to think of it, he did too. Buried him under the tree. Well, now, you come on and follow me down to my shack. I'll get one of the women folk to rustle you up some grub. All right. <clears throat> you, uh, you live here with your family? Family? <laughs> Young fella, you ain't never seen a family in your born days like mine. Uh -huh. Big? Big? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I lost count two years ago. But near as I can recollect, there's uh, five wives and 17 young ones. Or maybe it's 18 by now. One of the women's fixing to drop a calf any minute. I hope it's a boy this time. Last four have been little calicoes. Come on, let's go have a look, see. Nebraska Jack was a man of at least 70. Although not very tall, he still possessed the physique of a much younger man. His hair was long and white, and a fine, curly beard covered most of his face. He led me to what he called his shack. In actuality, it was more like a blockhouse, which stood three stories high. Situated on a rise above the river, it was quite an imposing sight. At the river's edge, I noticed a half a dozen or more naked children of varying ages. They saw him, waved happily, and went back to their play in the water. Uh, you, you can tie the horse up here. Right. Rose! Oh, Rosie! We got company. Put on the coffee. <clears throat> I'd offer you a drink, but uh, I ain't got more than enough for myself. Besides, a fellow your age don't want nothing to do with whiskey. Just rot your stomach clean through. Uh, uh, you don't have to say nothing to Rosie about me drinking. Oh, no, no. Of course not. Mister, you sure are polite. Are you a territorial senator or something? <laughs> no. Newspaper correspondent. Name's J.B. Kendall. Oh, that's so. Uh, let's go ahead in. That's my room through there. Did you build this place yourself, Jack? Uh, me and the older boys finished it last year. <laughs> of course, if the family keeps it growing, I'll, I'll have to be adding, I guess. Go ahead, sit down. Thank you. Uh, that's there. Newspaper correspondent, huh? English, ain't you? Yeah. I thought so, yes. <laughs> See, ever hear of an English writer feller called uh, Ruxton? Oh, yes. Uh, he was up in these parts years back. Oh, I see him. Nice fella. Of course, there was mostly Indians around here then. You know, you could go a year and not see a white man. Were you born in the West? No, I come out from Ohio when I was 12. And since then, I done and seen just about everything a man can in his natural life. I'd like to hear about it. Oh, you got a week? <laughs> no, only an hour or so, I'm afraid. No, I've got to catch the Rock Springs stage. Well, I'll just kind of wipe the brush over it. Yeah, I've been a trader, prospector, guide, scout. I freighted and trapped with Jim Bridger. You hear of Jim Bridger, ain't you? Oh, I should say so. And I used to run a ferry across the Green River on the Oregon Trail. I killed Indians and white men. I still got two bullets in my leg and a piece of ute arrow in my backside. Oh, well, along about 15 years ago, I was getting on past 60. I figured it was time to settle down, get me a wife. Trouble was, <laughs> I drifted the way of the Indians so long, I felt more like them than my own kind. So I up and married one. 
Oh, fine woman. But I, I thought you said that, that, that you had five wives, wasn't it? Yeah, that, that's right. But I didn't wed up with them all at once. First wife, she was Rappaho Nelly. She got kind of lonesome for woman company, so her cousin come to visit her. That was Mary. That was the second wife. Then there was Piney and Mandy and Rosie. Two Shoshone, one Ute. And, uh, and, and they all get on together? Uh, well, sure. <laughs> Ain't no reason why they shouldn't. Coffee in Nebraska. Well, that's just fine. Kendall, I want you to meet Rosie. This here's J.B. Kendall, Rosie. I this is, uh, Nebraska? Say, you know, I, I, I plumb forgot, Rosie. How's Piney doing, huh? She calved yet? I told you before, Nebraska, no talk like that. Piney have baby. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she have baby yet? No. Soon. Oh. Maybe tonight. Uh, uh, where's uh, where, where's Nellie? She down river looking to your trap line. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, what about Mary? Nebraska, you getting old in the head. You disremember everything. You send Mary and Mandy to fetch in sheep. <laughs> I'm not clean for God. Nebraska. <coughs> huh? Let me smell breath. Uh, Whiskey! Uh, Where are you hiding? Uh, oh, no, no, Rosie. No, no, Rosie. Ah, I'm right, fine. This Kendall, he bring it? Well, I... I no I, whiskey. I, I... How many times I tell you, no whiskey. He drink one DJ's, he cash in his chip. No whiskey, Nebraska. You hear? Mm, yes, ma'am. This Kendall, he stay for grub. No, no, thank you very much. I'll have to be going. Oh, no, 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 you don't have to do that. Why, well, Rosie here, she fixes the best chuck you ever said it to. No, me. no, really, the coach. Uh, you uh, got your baggage up there at the uh, stage station? Yes, and... Uh, oh, shucks, I'll get one of the boys to bring it down for you. You take the next coach out tomorrow. Sure, 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 you stay overnight. Oh, wait, we got plenty of room. Well, it's very kind of you. Did you hear that, Rosie? Don't he talk just fine, real educated. Now, you send one of the boys in, uh, Little Jack. Little Jack plucking chicken. What you want with him? Oh, what about Ben? Ben cutting wood. Joe catching fish. Mary's Pete cutting dam. Nellie's Pete helping. All right. I guess I'll just have to do it myself then. Do what? Go with Kendall up to the stage station and fetch in his baggage. Oh, no. No. I know what happens. You go to station that Ollie Monaghan. He sell you whiskey. Oh, no. Rosie, it ain't so, I, I swear. Uh, Kendall. Oh, no. Kendall, you wouldn't even let me smell the bottle now, would you? Oh, no. Well, I'm sure that I... There, 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 you see? Now, Kendall here, he's English, and when he gives his word... Oh, poor Rosie, you ain't got a thing to worry him. <laughs> oh, no. Kendall go to station himself, fetch baggage. You stay here, Nebraska. Why, you can't ask a guest to do that, Rosie. It ain't hospitable. There's no trouble. I don't mind in the least. Uh, 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 what do you figure he's going to say about us in his newspaper? We make him go fetch baggage his own self. Don't matter what he say. I know read anyhow. Now, you hold on, woman. I got patience, but I tell you, it's thin and fast. I'm the head man in this here house, and I'm telling you. I'm a-going with Kendall to fetch his baggage. You go to stage station, get drunk. Who says I'm... When you I'm... come back, you'll be sorry. Who says I'm going to get drunk? Tonight. Wife Piney having baby. Uh, all right, all right, all right. Me and Kendall will be back before dark. You remember what I tell you, Nebraska. This is the last time you drink whiskey. You no have woman. You no have kids. You no have nothing! Although I tried to dissuade him, Nebraska Jack insisted upon accompanying me. He must have known what was in my mind because by the time he had saddled up his horse, shown me a shortcut which took us five miles out of our way to the stage station, my coach bound for the South Pass District had already gone. We went into the waiting room. Well, that's the way things, see. Something told me there was a deceitful thought in your eye. Yes, sir. You was going to take off in that there coach and leave me high and dry down to the river now, wasn't you, Kendall? I must admit the thought did cross my mind. I figured, so you know what I done? I made you miss your coach. That's what I done. <laughs> hey, Ollie! Yeah? It's Nebraska Jack. Right in, Jack. <laughs> now, where'd you keep that whiskey of mine? Jack, why did you want me to miss my coach? Why? Well, 
I'll tell you. As long as I'm with you, I'm safe. Safe? Well, that's what I say, boy. Because when I start in bending an elbow, there's no telling what happens. Sometimes I just get plumb sleepy, and other times, well, sir, I, I, I just go on the warpath. Ain't no sense to it, but I like to get mad as a bear with two cubs and a sore tail. Yes, but I still don't understand what I've got to do with it. Well, you, you heard what Rosie said. If I come home drunk, you heard. Yes. Well, I'm going to just let you keep an eye on me. You're going to hold me down. And as soon as you calculate I've had enough, you're going to take me on home before I get drunk. Well, what happens if you don't want to go? Well, don't matter what I want. You've got to make me. You heard what she said. Now, 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 you give me your word. You, you'll do it. All right. Uh, howdy, Nebraska. Ain't seen you for a spell. Howdy, Ollie. Say, uh, my friend here, he wants to buy a bottle of your red eye. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. How's the wives, Nebraska? Oh, fair, fair, fair. And the kids? Oh, they're just fine, fine. Oh, keep it in the safe now, huh? That's right. Oh, only two bottles left, Nebraska. You want them both? And I, I, I guess what? Uh, you, you figured, Kendall? Uh, frankly, no. Uh, you just put it to the side, Ollie. We'll start with one. Sure, Nebraska. Oh, that'll be four dollars each, mister. Four? The last bottle was only three. Yeah, but this one is two weeks aged. Best in the house. <laughs> Wait a minute, Nebraska. I'll, I'll get some mugs. No sense of you drinking alone. <laughs> sure. Well, don't you give none to Kendall. He's too young to guzzle. Besides, he's promised to get me home sober. And that's just what he's going to do. Ain't that so, Kendall? Wherever the Red Cross serves, you serve too. You help the family whose home is lost by flood. The young soldier far away from home, the housewife learning home nursing, the youngster who wants to swim. Yes, wherever the Red Cross serves, you serve too. Support your Red Cross. Contribute to the Red Cross for members and funds. Answer the call. Join and serve. <laughs> Exactly one hour later, Nebraska Jack and Ollie Monaghan had demolished one bottle of what must have been the most violent whiskey in Wyoming territory. Monaghan had almost completely lost his voice and was trying to sing a song that he swore his mother had taught him. I found the words were somewhat obscure. Nebraska Jack had a peculiar gleam in his eye and was viewing the other whiskey bottle with great interest. It stood on the table beside my elbow. Uh, are, are, are you married, Kendall? No. I'm married, Kendall. I told him to talk English. Oh, that's the worst thing I ever done. Now they think like a white woman. Oh, that's worse yet. Now, let's open the other bottle. No. Well, you don't touch me. <laughs> you think I'm going to get drunk? <laughs> you are drunk. Oh, well, that is a lie. Now, Nebraska, you know what your wife said would happen this time. I'm going to tell you something about my wife, Rosie. Oh, she's the worst. Uh, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to scalp her. Right now, I'm going to scalp her. If you want my opinion, she'll end up scalping you. <laughs> they all will. Uh, uh, Rosie's a ute. Now, I got a piece of ute arrow on my backside. Never trust the ute. Uh, they want to ruin your life. Mm. What about the others? Oh, they're all right. Nellie, Mary, Amanda, Piney. But that Rosie ain't fitting for a woman to be so mean. Did you hear how she talks to me? Oh, give me that bottle of whiskey. Nope. I get through with you. Your kin won't be knowing you from fresh highs. Now, come on, come on, give me that bottle. Don't you want to be able to see your new son? What new son? Piney. She's going to have her baby tonight. <laughs> You know, Kendall, I'm bad news. I ain't even worth stomping on. Fact. Ain't right for a father to carry on so. All them kids at home, no pa to set them on the right trail. All them good wives are fixing and a fussing over me. I'm just a no good walking whiskey vat. 
How's about a drink, partner? Sorry. Uh, he's my pal, see? Partner. Oh, not you, you sidewinder. You trying to get me drunk? I got me a home with all them fine wives and kids. You know, Rosie will make them all pull stakes. She's you. She's just good. Come on, Jack. I'll take you home. You can sober up on the way. Uh, uh, no, it ain't no use. New baby won't be no boy. It'll be a girl, another girl, as sure as you're alive. That'll make five girls in three years. No, sir, fellas, I ain't the man I used to be. I might as well get drunk. You open it up the bottle of bar. Open it up, Kendall. No. Now, don't you go get me frothy, mister. I don't particularly care if you foam at the mouth. I made you a promise, and I intend to keep it. Although I have no idea why I should. You are going home. I am telling you, give me that bottle. And if you don't, I'm going to wrap your arms about your neck and give you the strangle. Hang up his eye, Nebraska. Clear his plow. Now, you, my friend, are a bad influence. Go away. <laughs> All right, Jack. Come on. You shouldn't have done that, boy. You're itching for trouble. I'm going to have to whip you down a mite. Come on, draw. I'm not going to fight you, Jack. Draw, you sniveling, long-eared wood pussy. I'm giving you a chance to fill your hand. And if you don't do it, I'm going to shoot you down like a sick coyote. I won't draw. Come on. No, go on, shoot. Say your prayers. <laughs> Say Did you hear that? Yes. Oh, uh, uh, a boy. That, that's what she said, wasn't it? That's what she said. A boy. Now, oh, that surely is a something. You better go home and see your son, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I reckon so. Say, you figure me for a pretty big fool, huh? Mm, I think it would be an idea if you put away the gun. You know, I'm just an alkali old man who ain't got the sense I was born with. At least, I'm getting sober mighty quick. That's good. You know, I'd take it as a kindness if, if, if you'd ride with oh, me. Oh, no, I don't think so. I, I ain't saying I blame you, but it'll be a pleasure to have you see the noon. Well, if I won't be in the way... I... In the way... Mister, with five women and 18 kids, how are you going to be in the way? <laughs> Come on, let's go. Nebraska Jack was completely sober by the time we arrived. The newcomer was of incredible size, weighing, I should judge, at least 14 pounds. The image of his father, with a thatch of curly black hair and a pair of immense lungs, his bellowing lasted far into the night. However, I was able to forgive him considering his parents had done me the honor of naming him J.B. Kendall. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Jack Moyles, and Virginia Gregg. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman, Bud Sewell speaking.
I left Cheyenne without my luggage and in company with a wild Irishman and his even wilder cargo of freight. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just a moment, we will bring you the latest report from the Frontier Gentleman. Whether your marriage license is brand new or your wedding ring is worn thin over the years you'll get a kick out of every light-hearted episode of CBS Radio's The Couple Next Door. Written by Peg Lynch, creator of Ethel and Albert, The Couple Next Door is a warm and humorous series about a young married couple. Just for the fun of it, join us on most of these same stations five days a week as Peg Lynch and Alan Bunn star as CBS Radio's The Couple Next Door. <laughs> Starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. Cheyenne, Wyoming Territory, had been good to me. And when I decided to leave, I informed the people at my hotel, packed my little bag of belongings and dropped by Carrie Chase's office to thank him for his kindnesses. From there, I went to the stage station and made arrangements for my departure. Having several hours' wait, I took a last turn around the town. I thought I had visited all of the saloons in search of people and stories from my column in the London Times. I was wrong. I had missed Dan's Bloody Bucket, a scant four blocks from the center of town. I shall never forget Dan, nor his Bloody Bucket. The man shouting was small, wearing a derby hat pulled low over shaggy eyebrows. He was holding a gigantic cat in his left arm, while with his right hand he was tugging a length of chain from beneath the folds of a swallowtail coat. He was facing a great brute of a man who was waving a broken whiskey bottle at him. Behind him, out of sight, another man was approaching with pistol butt raised. The odds against the little man were more than I could stand. Look out behind you! Oh, dear, save yourself! A saint has arrived. Oh, no, you don't blight her. Hey, you want to get in the stranger? The troops has arrived, you shilly shally mucky buck. The man seems to need a friend. You better move on, or what's going to happen to him will happen to you. Oh, the devil and the cat, the princess, she's jumped out of the arms. Grab her, saint. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, no, you shouldn't have done that. No. Grab him, Chief. Grab the stranger. I'll get him. Oh, I'll get him right now. Ah, oh, you've done it, Saint, you've done it. Now grab the cat. I'll swing me chain over these two. Grab her! What? The princess, the cat, grab her, lad. Who, who, who? What? She's going by, clap her oh, head. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Here you go, princess. Ah! I, uh, she's not friendly. Oh, grab her! All right, all right. Ah! Here now, here now, cat princess. Throttle her ah! now and make friends ah! later. Who, I, stop it, I say, stop it. Ah! I've got her. Ah! I've got her. Now let's get out of here. They're beginning to come around. Run, run. Oh, where? Where should we run? Out the door to me wagon. They won't never come near me chain. Now watch the cat. Don't let her get away. Now run. It's straight out with you. Now, now the cat. The cat into the box. Hurry, hurry, uh, hurry. Uh, there you go, lovey. Hey, you come on, you higher or an hoptail. Hey, you, hey, you. Ah, it's Dan. He's shooting. It's never again you'll see me down in the bloody bucket. Never. And the same to all of you, thunder corruption. Six times a week, here at the Star's Address, you'll find that the shortest distance between two smiles is the Amos and Andy Music Hall. For one thing, there's always a sparkling tune or two to give your spirits a lift. The guest list reads like a textbook in applied astronomy. And, of course, right at the heart of all the light-hearted things that happen at the music hall are the one and only two, Amos and Andy. 
Tomorrow and every Monday through Saturday on most of these same stations, listen for the Amos and Andy Music Hall. The little man drove at a most fantastic rate of speed. I sat in silence atop the wagon seat, holding my hat down with one hand, while the other clutched the side for support. Our exit was punctuated by the princess hurling herself at my bottom side in magnificent rages, and I was thankful for the barrier of wood between us. In the bed of the wagon were numerous large crates full of cats of all sizes and colors. There seemed to be no one in pursuit, and after some minutes, the little man slowed the wagon, and without looking at me, he painfully lit a pipe. I presumed we were now somewhere in the barren area between Wyoming Territory and the Dakotas. Ah, perils. Perils of the trade, me boy. I would say. Ah, you've done a grand thing, lad. The princess there is the start of a whole new race she is. I had to have her. What? You mean the, the princess belonged to Dan? <laughs> and what did you think, huh? Then... Can I help you steal the cat? Oh, tush, tush. You merely laid down a blow he'll not be forgetting. But you, you said grab the cat. I thought she belonged to you. Hey, don't let the technicalities bother you. It is a proper thing you've done. Uh, I, I don't understand. Well, I supplied Cheyenne with her cats in the first place, and I reserved the right to have access, as it were, to, uh, to their progeny. I see. And if Dan pursues us, then what? Well, if me luck holds, he won't find us. And if it doesn't? Never bother trouble, me lad. Look at me, lad. Yes? You have a bit of England in you. Why, yes, as a matter of fact. Ah, me worst fears. What did you say your name was? I didn't. It, it's Kendall. J.B. Kendall. Ah, and I thought the saints had smiled. My name is Kerrigan, Shane Kerrigan. And you might as well have it straight out. I'm an Irishman. Uh, what's your business, Kendall? I write stories concerning the West for the London Times. Oh, that is a good town, London. I was there once when I was a mere boy. Good, good, good town. Too bad it's so full of the English. <laughs> Mr. Kerrigan, I'd be indebted to you if you'd tell me something about yourself for my readers. Uh, oh, no, wait a minute. Will you stop your blather, pussycat? <clears throat> it was on a bright summer morning when the birds sweetly sang on each bough that I first saw me Kathleen Mavornian as she sat a milking her cow. Ha, there. It's a miracle. Now, Kendall, uh, uh, what uh, was it you wanted to know about? Yes, this cat business of yours. I was going to ask, how does it work? Oh, very simple. I'm on my way to save Deadwood at this time. Save Deadwood? I have 62 cats, 62 furry creatures in the proper positions, and the town will be rid of its varmints in a matter of hours. And you intend to sell your cats? That I do, at ten dollars a head. Ten dollars? People pay ten dollars for them? Now, where have you been, Mr. Kendall? Do you not know that civilization rises or falls according to the number of cats in the towns and villages? But I just never thought of it. <laughs> oh, the great plague in Europe was due to the shortage of cats. I suppose you're right. Of course I'm right. Well, when you get to Deadwood, just how do you plan to go about the uh, the sale of your cats? Well, I, uh, I have a staunch friend there, dear, dear Margaret. I shall make me headquarters with this lovely lady, and soon the word will spread that I have arrived with me cats. And will this uh, this lady appreciate your coming in with all this, this baggage? Yeah, it'll take a bit of doing, me boy, I don't deny that. But Miss Margaret has had an eye for Jane Carrigan these many years. Before it is done, she'll embrace me and me cats. Yeah. Well, I'd rather like to ride along, if you don't mind. Oh, tis welcome you are. Hey up there, little one. You've rested long enough. Come here. <laughs> Your horse. She seems to love her work. <laughs> that she does. Oh, it was on a bright summer morning. Oh, and the birds sweetly sang in each bow. That I first saw me Kathleen my... Uh-oh. That'll be Dan, the tenacious one. Hiya, girl, hiya! Uh, we'll give him a run for his dust. I turned in my seat, and sure enough, it was Dan on horseback, accompanied by another rider. 
Mr. Kerrigan clamped his jaw and his pipe leaned forward, and the wagon flew across the rocky ground. Is he there, Kendall? Can you still see the Hayden? Yes! He's closer! Shane! You might as well stop! Stop! Are you daft? Ah, I wouldn't suffer the devil himself! Get along there! Hurry up! Then it happened. A rock, half as big as the horse, loomed up in the road. Jane Kerrigan couldn't miss it. Look out! We're going to hit! Do you ever see so many cats in the air at one time? There's only one cat I'm looking for. Oh, me heart, I've had it this time. Me heart can't take no more. Are you... Oh. Are you all right, Mr. Kerrigan? No, I'm dead and dying. The wagon's across me leg. I came for uh. my cat, you old goat. Where is she? Kendall, how's me horse and cat? Uh, the horse... Horse is all right, but the crates are broken and the cats are scattering. Are you listening to me? I want that cat. She was the best mouser in Cheyenne. Ah, you see here. See here, Dan, whatever your name is. Oh. Can't you see this old gentleman is hurt? Now, give me a hand. We'll get the wagon off him. Now, you ought to do it, Dan. Your cat ain't worth killing, though, fella. I ain't helping nothing. It's a cat I come for, and I'm going to get. And I say you're going to help me. Here. No, no, Kent. Ah. Let, let him go. It's me dying wish she take the cat. Dan! Dan, you can see they've all scattered to the winds. Find yours and take her. I'm going to do just that. Come on, Jake. Let's find him before she gets lost. Wait. I'll need help moving this man. Oh, no, 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 no. Are you daft? What about the princess? Well, the wagon box is still closed. Oh, good, good. What about you? Well, the kind of help I need, the likes of them can't give. Now, come on, give me a hand here. All right, I'll try. Oh, now, gee. when I lift it... You try to pull yourself out. Oh, yes, yes. Now, up. How you doing? Oh, How do you up there? Oh. oh, Kendall, she's bent. Oh, my leg is bad. Bent. Yeah. Yes. Let me help you. Oh, may I be forgiven an Englishman keeping me? It is more important to get the cats back. Whew. Now, break out the tripe and liver. They can smell it for miles. Then, whilst they're coming in, we can make our repairs and be off for Deadwood. <laughs> Whatever happened to, uh, what's his name? You know who I mean. That hypertense newsman who reported every wild rumor he ever heard. Well, we don't know what happened to him, but we can tell you that reliable newsmen like Larry Lesur, Lowell Thomas, and all of their colleagues at CBS News are still very much preferred by listeners everywhere. Five nights a week, Larry Lesur and Lowell Thomas broadcast the news on most of these same stations. Interestingly enough, their consistently accurate and carefully detailed reports provide much more excitement than cheap sensationalism ever could. It was true. The tripe and liver could be smelled upwind, downwind, probably in Deadwood itself. The cats came streaming in, and with each group I expected to see Dan and his friend, but we had seen the last of them. Mr. Kerrigan was considerably lamed by the accident, but managed to move about amazingly well. I made all the necessary repairs to the wagon and the crates, and by morning we were underway. We finally arrived at Deadwood, which had the look of all boom towns, a long, narrow street with wooden frame structures along the sides. The dwelling of Miss Margaret turned out to be a large saloon with upstairs lodging quarters. It was called simply Maggie's Place. You're certain this is it, Mr. Kerrigan? Oh, oh. Aye, this is it. You go tell Miss Margaret. Chain Kerrigan is sick and wounded and needs lodging. All right. Uh, lively with you now. Uh. Mister. Can I help you? Why, yes, I believe you can. I think I'd like to. My name's Charlene. Have I seen you here before? No, I don't believe so. I'm looking for Miss Margaret. Miss Margaret? <laughs> sure you are. Hey, Maggie. Yeah? 
There's a fella here wants to see you. Well, send him over. Don't forget me. Charlene. Mr. Mr. Uh, Kendall. Kendall. Yes. Uh, that's Maggie over there. The big fat one at the end of the bar. I'll be around if you want to buy me a drink later All on. All right, Charlene. Thank you. Max, you can change to the bad whiskey now. Nobody will know the difference. Well, hello, stranger. What can I do for you? I'm looking for a lodging. Not a for... chance, no chance. We've been full up for weeks. Ain't you heard about the strike at Gold Run Gulch? And no, I just arrived. No, this was for a friend of mine. He's outside. You know him, uh, Mr. Chain Kerrigan? Chain? Well, why didn't you say so? <laughs> Charlene! What? Fix up the good room for a friend of mine and hurry it up. Maggie almost cried at the sight of Chain cradled in my arms as I carried him up to the room prepared for him. There, lying back on the bed, he lifted a hand feebly toward me. Oh, Kendall, good lad. Who'd you be about bringing up me, uh, me luggage? Oh, the poor, poor man. You mean you want all... Uh, yes, 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 all of them. And, and, and don't forget the, the, the rations. It's most important, lad. Now go. Oh, why do you bother the poor, ailing man with his trivialities now? Bring up his baggage, as he says. There's a back way, and it won't bother no one. Oh, Margaret, come to me, sir. Oh, yes, yes, love. Now, what is it? Are you sure I'm not imposing on you? Well, now, what kind of a woman do you take me for? Oh, oh Margaret, darling. It's worth the whole trip and trouble and the accident to my leg just to get back and, and look into your eyes. Go to sleep, sweetheart. And you can have your friend Kendall right here with you. Oh, no. I, I mean, uh... It'll be rather crowded here. I can find a place. Well, how can it be crowded? Two men in a big room like this? Well, maybe not. I just hate to... Uh... Well, that's the end of it right now. I'll have another bed set in for you. <sighs> Thank you. That's very nice of you. Look at him, Mr. Kendall. Poor man has fallen asleep. And we stand here, John, in front of him. Come on, come on. Oh, uh, before you go, darling... Uh, would you be sending up four fingers of your best whiskey uh, for my leg? Well, of course. I'll have Charlene bring it right away. You can see, Mr. Kendall, nobody understands Chain Kerrigan like I do. I guess he's told you, hasn't he? The reason he's come back to Deadwood is to marry me. <laughs> Nobody saw me staggering up the back steps with crate after crate of cats. As for Chain, he busied himself drinking the liquor provided for him and instructed me to release and feed the cats. Eventually it was over and we finally got settled down, in a manner of speaking. But in the morning, the swarm had to be fed all over again. <sighs> it's uh, quite a job, isn't it? It is a labor of love, my boy. <clears throat> Did, uh, did Miss Margaret see you bring in our uh, friends in last evening? No, no, she didn't. Uh, but what do you plan to do about selling them now, crippled up the way you are? I have a plan, Kendall, a wee bit of a plan. Chain love, it's Margaret with your breakfast. Can I come in? Oh, please do, darling. Well, uh, did you sleep well? Oh! What goes on here? Get out! Get out! Oh, 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 Margaret, get, get. girl, Margaret, you've lost control of yourself. Oh, so this is the way you thank me, Chain Kerrigan. Well, you can get out, too. What? I'll not have this kind of a mess. Go on, get, Oh, right, Margaret, get. Margaret, come to me, side love. I'll come to your side. I'll take an axe to you. But it's my business, love, selling cats. I told you that when I was here before. Yes, yes, you told me. But I don't expect you to let him a place with them. Uh, <laughs> uh, possibly I could help in some manner. <laughs> you can, Mr. Kendall. You can open the back door for Chain Kerrigan and his cat. Have you been told last year lovelier than ever when you're shouting like that? Oh, get him out. Margaret, now would you be allowing $620 to walk out the back way? I don't care how much money you... Uh... What? <clears throat> How much did you say? Sixty-two cats. Not counting the princess, of course. I could never sell her. She's my breeding stock. Sixty-two cats at ten dollars apiece. That's six hundred twenty dollars. 
Now, Mr. Kendall, a man with that much money could support himself and a loved one for a good long time now, could he not? Why, yes. I suppose he could, Mr. Kerrigan. <clears throat> Margaret, sir, uh, have you ever thought of marriage, a woman of your beauty and accomplishments? Well, uh, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, I... Uh, <clears throat> Jane, Jane, you're proposing to me, ain't you? I knew that's why you'd come back. <laughs> now, when my leg heals and I'm able to get about and sell the cats, then I can make the plans closest to me heart. Oh, Jane, I got an idea. Oh, what is it, beauty? I'll sell the cats for you. No, no, you can't mean it. Now, how would you be doing that? Why, they'll buy. They'll buy or else. Who, who'll buy? My, uh, my clientele. I have a certain power here in Deadwood, as you know, Jane, and they'll buy from me. Well, no, but if it, if it wasn't for my leg, I, I, I wouldn't let you do oh, this. Oh, don't worry about your leg. By tomorrow, you'll have $620, and I'll have the preacher come by in the afternoon. Now, what do you say to that, Jane? Oh, huh? One thing at a time, Margaret, one thing at a time. Now, uh, uh, how would you be going about selling those cats? <laughs> That was the last I saw of Chain Kerrigan. I found a room for myself in town, lay on the bed for a moment, and, well, it was the next morning before I awoke. I rushed over to Maggie's place. Above her own sign, there was another one. It said, Cat Sale. Get yours now. On the door of the saloon itself, there was another sign saying, Closed. I knocked, and Charlene, the girl I had first met at Maggie's, came to the door. Oh, Hello, Mr. Kendall. I'm sure glad to see you this morning. But y'all better not come in. What? Why? What happened? Oh, come on. Let's walk down the street. It's about Mr. Kerrigan. Mr. Has he died or something? Worse. He's left. Oh, oh well, then <laughs> that's good. Oh, no, it ain't. He didn't wait for the wedding and say goodbye to Maggie or nothing. Just got his wagon and left. What about his cats? She sold them all last night. Gave him over $600. Why, you never seen so many men buying cats in all your life. <laughs> How's she taking it? Oh, all right. Every time she feels bad, she counts her money again. Her money? Sure. She sold those cats for $15 a piece. Made over $300 for herself. What? <laughs> Why, that's marvelous. <laughs> Charlene. What? You come on with me. I'll buy you that drink I promised you. Why, Mr. Kendall. Frontier Gentlemen was produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's script was written by Tom Hanley and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Martha Wentworth, Charlotte Lawrence, Joseph Kearns, Barney Phillips, and Harry Bartell. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Bud Sewell speaking. <laughs>